I wouldn't say that my family was like particularly financially savvy. And so maybe I've witnessed some of the things like a little bit of lifestyle inflation, a little bit of being too comfortable taking on debt and stuff like that. And I wouldn't say it was really until around um, the past few years, probably like the early days of the pandemic when I was wandering around the streets of Boston, they're mostly empty, listening to books and podcasts and stuff. And I just, I really started getting into the FI community, listening to a lot more podcasts on financial independence, uh, reading some of those really influential books like Simple Path to Wealth by JL Collins and a few others I could name. And those kind of made an impact on me. And what really resonated was the idea that it kind of sucks to go through the typical pattern of like living a life where you're kind of shackled to a full-time job for all of the years that are like your best years and all the hours during the day that are oftentimes your best hours where you feel like the most inspired and energetic. Um, a lot of that gets siphoned off to a, to a traditional job, right? And it would be cool if there was a way to set up your finances so that you could live a little bit more freely and have a lot more autonomy, the ability to choose how you want to spend your time, what you want to do with it. And so I guess that was sort of how I started getting into all that stuff. But as I was walking around listening to podcasts, I was like, hey, it'd be really cool if I had a way to map out my own journey and get a sense for what my life's trajectory might look like and better understand the spectrum of possible outcomes there. And so I took a while and I was looking around at other products, trying to see like, okay, there must be something that exists for this, right? And of course there, there were some things I tried out stuff like personal capital, um, on trajectory, new retirement, a couple others. Um, I'd used budgeting apps and things before too, but none of the stuff that I played with, um, really ticked off like all of the things that I wanted to see in a robust and granular planning tool. And that's kind of what sent me down the path of saying, well, you know what, why don't I try to build something? And like, I think it is with a lot of people, I started off with just a spreadsheet. So I sat down and I was like, okay, what's, what's the stuff that I really want to see? And I started to build one of those out. And before I knew it, I had friends and family asking for copies. And then there were tons of feature requests. And then you get in there and you look at those formulas and you're just like, man, this thing has grown into a monstrosity. <laughs> How am I ever going to maintain this thing? And so, and also like have confidence in you know, anytime you do add a new feature, make a change, like you want to be very, very certain that the thing that you're changing isn't going to undermine any of the other formulas or, you know, suffice it to say that it just became unmanageable. And I was like, there's gotta be a better way. So I sat down and I started working on a web app and one thing led to another. And here we are like a year and a half later, I've been building this thing and it's kind of out there. I think there's awareness that's been spreading a little bit. Obviously you guys found out about it and I'm happy you invited me on the show. I've never done a podcast before and I hope the, the audience braces themselves a little bit because you guys have had some very preeminently successful people on here. And I, I think I'll probably be one of your least articulate and least successful podcast guests. So as long as you're willing to put up with that, um, thanks for having me and I'm excited to chat. I'm sure it's going to be a great conversation because like you said, you mean you built this thing from the ground up, so you're going to know its ins and outs. And, but as we kind of continue to build that, you know, a little bit of profile background of how you got to this point so like what was your plan like you built this extreme planner what was your plan mm -hmm. before kind of 2020 when you started listening to all these podcasts and reading all these books and starting to build your own spreadsheets like were you just kind of going day by day or did you have a do you have a thought in your mind of this is what retirement would look like this is kind of reasonable numbers i would say before that my plan was uh a little bit more short term. It was kind of like looking towards the next, okay, when can I go on another scuba diving trip to the Caribbean? Um, I got a lot into that and like underwater videography and stuff. And so I hadn't ever really mapped out what my whole life's finances might look like. I know that may be strange to say on a show that's dedicated to planning things out to the nth degree, right? But it was definitely more of a recent thing for me. So I think like earlier on, I had some of the principles in place, like try to, you know, spend less than you earn and invest the difference, but it wasn't really mapped out to a super specific degree. And so painting more of your profile and like growing up in college, what did you go to school for? Like, how did you, you know, have the skills to build a financial app? I mean, that's something like I would just go in blind. I would have no idea. Did you go to school for computer science? Were you already working in a job where you were like coding different apps or where did all that yeah, skill so, come from? So I did undergrad um, computer engineering. And then I also did, I got a master's from Georgia Tech in computer science. 
My background's in software engineering. Um, I've been messing around with computers ever since I was a little kid. I guess it started with um, me in elementary school getting my hands on Microsoft Excel and building like a, a trading card game I could sell to my little brother's friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it kind of progressed from there to like developing uh, little video games in middle school. I remember sitting there at home in like the early, what, what, what would it have been like the early 2000s or something, um, messing around with like one of the easier to pick up kind of game engines, trying to figure out like, okay, what the hell is a variable? Like before we had covered, you know, X equals five in math class and that kind of stuff. Um, so I had an, inter an early introduction to, to that. And I think that just kind of continued to compound over time as I got more interested in it and then eventually figured out it was what I wanted to do as a career. Um, maybe one of the big moments for that would be the internship that I did with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Hurricane Hunters Group in, I guess that would have been between junior and senior year of undergrad. Um, like I kind of alluded to, Money was always a little bit tight. I went to like state school for undergrad, uh, University of Maine, and I was always hunting around for scholarship opportunities. So this one that I came upon was the Noah Hauling Scholarship Program. Uh, managed to get it, and the way that it works is they give you a little bit of funding for like junior and senior year of undergrad, and you do an internship with one of their line offices in the middle. And so I got matched up with um, their Hurricane Hunters outfit that was operating out of uh, MacDill Air Force Base down in Tampa at the time. So I took my little Subaru, of course I drive a Subaru from Maine, right? and <laughs> drove from you know Maine to Florida for the summer and spent the summer trying to build some software solution that could connect all of their data sources from their airborne atmospheric measurement and profiling system and show them like a real-time feed of all the wind readings that they'd collected and all the important flight data that they needed to see on like a moving map so that they could make better decisions on where to send the aircrafts and how to fly into a hurricane correctly to collect the best data. And so that was like a really cool project to be able to work on as an intern and also a really challenging one. I think um, when, you know, when I showed up, it was the kind of situation where they didn't have a lot of computer science staff. And so they didn't really understand like the nuts and bolts of what they were asking. They were more just thinking like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could get one of these, you know, free for us Hollings interns to like build us a thing that could visualize all this stuff. And so they kind of asked for the moon and um, I just, I worked as hard as I could to deliver it to them. And it was just a, it was a really rewarding project because there was a chance to build something where you could see the impact right away and you could build something that made, made people's eyes light up. And that was just kind of an addictive feeling for me to be able to take something from idea to a thing that exists in the world and that people can interact with and, and use to make an impact. So I think like from then on, I was pretty set on doing stuff with software. And over the years, I've, uh, in addition to like working a full-time software engineering job, I've um, always had little side projects here and there. And obviously things change all the time in technology. So things are probably a lot different than they were when you started messing around in the early 2000s, you know, figuring out what a variable was. So like if somebody's looking to get into this kind of thing, they're wanting to learn how to build web apps, which to me seem like mm -hmm. where like really most things are going. I mean, there's no need to really install software most of the time. Even mobile mm -hmm. apps sometimes are getting to where it's these kind of instant downloaded, you know, kind of running in the background, like running on a browser type applications versus actually installing something from the app store. If people want to get into this kind of thing where you know, it's it, presumably a little bit more lightweight and a little bit more open to everyone to be able to, to work on and to build a project. What's the place like you would kind of point them towards uh, to start learning the skills to build something like this? Because what you've built is super intricate. It's got a lot of visuals. It's got a lot of uh, functionality. But, uh, you know, I imagine somebody want to get started. Like, where would you point them towards? Well, you definitely don't get started with trying to build something like Projection Lab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's like a graveyard of hundreds of side projects and games and terrible things that I've created ever you know since I was a kid that kind of got me, I guess, to this point where I can finally take on stuff and where I know that when I start a project, I can envision the solution from beginning to end and know that it'll work when it all comes together. It takes a long time to get there, but the cool thing about this field is that there are so many resources out there. I mean, you can just go on YouTube and find dozens of people that'll teach you about whatever aspect of software engineering or computers you're interested in. 
And I mean, YouTube's not the only place, right? There's just tons of articles. Um, I spend a decent amount of time on Hacker News. I find that's like a fun community. That's one of like the, the last bastions of a uh, place for high quality discussion on the internet that has kind of like a shared experience. I mean, with the way things are trending towards like individualized feeds where everybody's in their own little bubble that an algorithm has decided that you will like to be in. Um, it's kind of refreshing to go back to a space where everybody sees the same stuff and the highest quality stuff tends to bubble to the top, not just the stuff that's optimized for highest engagement. Um, maybe I've drifted a little bit from the top tier, <laughs> but hopefully that gives you a little insight. Uh, no, definitely, definitely helpful and helpful insight. A question I get from a lot of people who, you know, everyone and their uncle has an idea for like the next big app, but a lot of people aren't software developers. They don't even want to try. I know Justin was kind of like leading the question toward like, how do people get started? But I know some people just, they have the idea, but they just want to outsource it. Like they just want to find someone who can do the coding for them, who can get the app up and running. Mm -hmm. Is there like a best place? Like, is there like a hub of people who are like looking to partner with people with ideas or, you know, we're going to get into projection lab and all that stuff, but I'm just, I get that question so much and I don't have a good answer for us. I'm hoping maybe you do Kyle. Well, I'm not one who has sought to outsource things. So I don't think I have direct experience in that space. But I'm sure you're right that there must be some places out there where people can sort of pair the folks that have ideas with the folks that do the implementation. I mean, there's certainly um, sites like, uh, I think Fiverr is one, right? Like where you'll have people that do freelance work. And so you can kind of browse like to look for people with the skill sets that you think you need to build out a product that you have in mind. Um, stuff like that would probably be what I would check out first. But like I said, I would need to dig into that space a little bit more before I was able to give you my rundown of like the top places to go. Um, I do think that there, there can be some risks with trying to outsource work for a product that's kind of like your, your brainchild and you really want to see it grow. But if you don't have experience with development, then you know, maybe there are sometimes not that many alternatives. Uh, something that also might be interesting to check out would be some of the no-code tools that exist. Um, that's also a space that I have not really forayed into because I tend to build things um, on my own from scratch. Maybe not from scratch. I think that's probably a controversial word in like the development space because pretty much anything that you do is going to be standing on the shoulders of people that have come before to build libraries and frameworks that you use to cobble stuff together. But um, yeah, I'm not out there using no code tools. So let's think about like when you first started realizing, hey, the spreadsheet's not going to cut it. I've got to build something. What you envisioned it to be, how close is it to what you have today? Did you think it would be this far further, much less? Like, what did you think you were going to build when you started to actually build an, a web application for Projection Lab? Well, I would say that where it is now is pretty close to my initial vision for where I hoped it could one day be. But I definitely didn't have like ironclad confidence that I was going to continue building it until it got to this point. Like obviously it took me a year and a half of working like very hard on nights and weekends and sacrificing a lot of that time to, to try to grow it to this extent. And I think it was maybe a few months in when uh, I remember I was like, I biked over to a friend's house. We were sitting around um, sharing a few IPAs. And, and talking about stuff. And I was lamenting at the time um, how this thing was doing compared to my side project just before it that I had recently shut down. Um, before this one, I had built this little tool that could do some social media automation and help you like grow your social media accounts by using some stats and heuristics to find people that would be likely to enjoy your stuff and then do some things that would build social credit like credit and hopefully get them to, to follow you it was a less um noble pursuit than uh, a financial planning tool right I, it always felt kind of frivolous from the start but i was just messing around with it it started kind of taking off but i read the terms of use for like the platform that i was doing some automation with a little bit more closely and it was like maybe this isn't the best thing to be investing my time in so i shut that down and you know i was at my friend's house like i mentioned talking about how, well, I don't really know if that many people are going to want to like whip out a credit card to pay for something that's all about fiscal responsibility the same way that they will for something that'll get them more, you know, likes and engagement on social media. Um, but lo and behold, I, I posted it to Hacker News around maybe last April or something like that. And I didn't think much of it at the time. I didn't really expect it to take off. I went over and did some other stuff and came back to my inbox blowing up and tons of people hitting the site and commenting and it was that uh, initial burst of activity that gave me a lot of motivation and energy to, to keep building it and ultimately grow it to the point where it is today. 
So what exactly is Projection Lab in a nutshell? Like, what are we projecting? Is it retirement date? Is it how much money you're going to have at a certain point in time? Or, you know, what, what, are the proje- what are the projections that this app is spitting out? Well, it's kind of all of that stuff, man. It's like your life. It's like, what do you think is going to happen throughout your life? And one of the cool things about it is that it allows you to define the stuff that's important to you. So I've noticed from all of these books and podcasts that people tend to define some terms like financial independence differently from person to person. It can mean different things. Maybe you care more about being like debt free or having a certain multiple of your expenses, or maybe your net worth or your liquid net worth reaches like a certain amount um, or, or whatever. And so one of the things that I wanted to prioritize was to make it possible for people to plug in their own custom definitions for this stuff and then make it really straightforward to visualize when you achieve those things. And then something that I had always wanted to build and finally did as of a few months ago is the ability to to take that a step further and bind certain things in your plan. Like let's say future life decisions when those things like start or end, whether it's like buying a rental property or like taking on a new job or changing your sort of expense profile or whatever, be able to bind those types of decisions to some of these custom milestones is what they're called in the app. Stuff that matters to you, things that you might achieve in life and what the definitions of those things are so that you can create some pretty dynamic configurations. So if you go in there and you're like, well, I think I'm gonna achieve financial independence under these set of criteria. And then you can change when certain expenses occur or when other items in your plans occur based on when that happens. And so it's it makes it possible to change a whole bunch of stuff just by playing with like one or two numbers and seeing all of the knock-on effects that could have with your plan and the spectrum of possible outcomes. The thing that jumps out to me, and I'm sure to anybody who uses it, would just be like the robustness, the amount of variables, the amount of change that you can put in here, the the amount of customization that you can kind of layer on top of each other. I'm sure you did a lot of market research, like looking at other tools, whether it be like the little retirement planner and personal capital or whatever, but maybe Mm -hmm. like that could be another way we could frame, you know, what projection lab is is thinking about some of the tools maybe people are familiar with and talking about some of the differences this has like some of the additions that this has that you may not find other places yeah you'll notice from my previous answer that i'm not a sales or marketing guy like and that that would probably (laughs) be like a good addition to (laughs) this kind of an effort right uh i don't really have an intention to like add employees at this point i like working on it as a side project and, and having full creative control too much but I think it probably jumps out that I'm not a sales and marketing dude. It's not really in my blood. Um, I just go straight to the heart of like some of the, the cool and configurable things in the app. But yeah, to your point, Justin, um, it's, uh, you can do a lot with it. You can plan a lot of different aspects of life and not just in like a deterministic kind of way where you have like fixed assumptions, like fixed growth rates. But you can really get in there and control like, okay, what if there's an inflation spike in a year or, you know, right now, uh, what effect does that have on my long-term odds of success? And you can go and run custom Monte Carlo simulations and define uh, the variables that you're interested in and get a better understanding of what the full spectrum of possible outcomes might look like, as opposed to just that one happy path that people sometimes like to plan on. Could you quickly just define a Monte Carlo simulation for listeners? It's basically just running a bunch of simulations using different variables and configuration and then aggregating the results and reporting on some some stats. So basically it's like you have this percentage of, you know, success given these circumstances, right? Pretty much, yeah. So like one way that you could sort of think about it is like, okay, let's run a trial starting at every historical year and kind of moving through time using some of the historical like US data on like stock market returns and things like that. And getting a sense for like, depending on what year we start in, like how do we end up doing and what are our overall percentage chance of success? And a lot of this can start to sound, you know, fairly complicated to somebody, especially, you know, if they're just used to using something like Mint or whatever. So like, what mm-hmm. would you say to somebody who, uh, you know, you think could benefit from having this much more control over their plan, but maybe get a little intimidated by there are so many buttons to push. There are so many variables to include. 
Yeah, there's definitely a lot of buttons. There's no getting around that. Um, but I've done my best to try to use techniques like progressive disclosure so that you're not slammed right away with like the most detailed configuration interfaces where there's some sensible defaults that get populated for a lot of the stuff that you might choose. And so you're kind of walked through the process gradually as opposed to just getting a giant window full of like a ton of different input elements. Um, I try to chunk things in a way so that it's a little bit more approachable. And if you guys have any feedback that you think could make it even more so, uh, feel free to share. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to, so I'm, I'm on Projection Lab right now. And so right when you get started, just so listeners can kind of visualize this and hopefully check it out for themselves, you have like basically build your own profile and then you have like the sandbox. I think you were just kind of alluding to sandbox. Mm -hmm. We have some of those like presets. It's like, you know, I'm a single person who just graduated or I'm married and I'm in my mid thirties. So could you talk about like, I guess the genesis of those different personas and like how you created them and you know, what types of numbers people can see in their dashboards? Yeah. So with, uh, with the sandbox there, the idea with that was just to provide a way for the people that kind of want to see how the tool works and how it looks when the interface is fully populated to do that with like zero effort. So you don't have to sign up or do anything like that. You can just hop into an example with all that data fully populated. And I kind of sourced the personas based on feedback from the projection lab community. I've been growing a discord server where folks can pop in and ask questions and give feedback and stuff like that. And so, a lot of those were, were informed by like the general conversations I've had with users to try to get a sense for what sorts of profiles and personas people would want to see in the tool. Um, but certainly if you're looking to try it out for yourself, I think it makes more sense generally to do the, the full walkthrough since that'll actually be tailored to you. Either and, way, as you and as you, and as I mentioned earlier, like the robustness of the tool is just, it's like very impressive. For instance, like I'm looking at the house section right now and you can put in, you know, what your taxes are, your maintenance costs, you can set percentages of that, your insurance costs, but not only does it list those variables, but it also gives you like kind of links out to things to educate you on what you should set that number as. How did you kind of go about, you know, getting all that information together to not only allow people to run these projections, but to educate them on what they should be putting in the projection. So I suppose if a real company was building this tool, they would probably be like running a full on, you know, content game and like writing all kinds of articles and like linking to their own stuff. But I'm just one dude. So what I tried to do was incorporate educational resources that I had used in planning my own stuff. So as I went out there and I was doing research on all these topics, I would kind of keep a list of the stuff that I found most useful and then find a way to feed that back into the tool in places that might help other people estimate some of these things. And I can see this in the tool, and I know it's something that Justin and I talk about a lot. Sometimes expenses don't go out to eternity. Like, for example, Justin got a new truck this past year, and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's going to have like a five or seven year, uh, five or seven year loan on it. So, you know, eight years out, you don't want to be baking that into like your 25x multiple to see when you're going to hit your fine number. How does that kind of work in Projection Lab? Like, do you set like a shelf life on different stuff that you're going to be paying for. Like, you know, I'm having a kid this next 18 years is going to cost this much, mm -hmm. but maybe after that, like now that expense goes away or how does someone map that out in their own journey? Exactly. Yeah. So like with the, the example with a kid, maybe you would create a milestone that's like, I'm going to have a kid. And then <laughs> you would create some expenses that, or even just one expense item, let's say that is like childcare costs or something. And so you would just define the start and end date for that thing relative to that milestone. So you would say this thing starts at the milestone when I have a kid and it ends at that milestone, like plus 18 years or something like that. So for each of the age selectors in there, there's an offset that you can add. So you can bind it to like a milestone and say, oh, this actually happens two years before this other thing or 18 years after in, in this hmm. case. So there's a lot of um, flexibility there with how you can configure stuff. And you can even go so far as to like define patterns of expenses or like asset purchases and sales. So if you know that you're going to buy like a new car every five years or every 10 years or something, you can just configure that once and say that I want to establish a recurrence pattern for this thing. And it should happen like every X years or, you know, X years apart. And um, maybe you want to scale it up or down each time by like a certain percent. So all of those things are, are possible to do. Another section in here that I thought was was pretty cool was like specifically calling out your passive income and even breaking down things into 
like side hustles or whatever and, and letting you kind of label it as passive versus mm-hmm. like active income. I just don't know if you want to talk a little bit about like your thought process going into that and let listeners know the different types of way that they can classify income, the different categories you break it out into. Yeah, that was one of those ideas that was sourced from the community. Um, there's always people at all hours of the day and night um, asking stuff in the Projection Lab Discord. And I try my best to be as responsive as I can. And that was one of those popular ideas where it, it was pretty clear that everybody has their own kind of idea of what stuff might be passive income versus active income. And so I added that extra metric that you can see in the yearly summary pane and the ability to control like what counts as passive income. And it seems like a lot of people, their definition of FI or when they might choose to retire might be based on a certain level of passive income or maybe passive income as it compares to your expenses or really any number of other configurations. But it was clear that it was an important metric for people. And so I wanted to to provide something for that. Yeah, especially someone like in my situation, Justin and I actually recently recorded an episode on like the different speeds of financial independence. And, you know, a thousand dollars a month from, you know, rental real estate is a lot different than a thousand dollars a month in like an active side hustle, like driving for Uber, or even from a day job, because like that stuff is recurring. It's going to keep happening mm-hmm. over and over. And so, yeah, most tools don't have a way to kind of break those and chunk them out. Like the thousand dollars per month in rental income, if you could get that up to like $5,000 per month, now you're spending is 5,000, then boom, you're financially independent. But you know, with something like an active income job or a side hustle that requires you to trade your time, then it's a totally different situation. So I, yeah, I, I love how you broke it out in there. Um, one other cool okay. feature I saw in Projection Lab was kind of the drawdown order. And I know mm-hmm. this is something that gets talked about and debated a lot on Twitter, <laughs> on different personal finance threads. Like how did you go about determining the best drawdown order for people? And how does that, I guess, work from a functionality standpoint, like determining which buckets people need to pull from before another one? Yeah, well, pretty much there's just a drawdown module for each um, account type or maybe a collection of account types if they're similar enough. And so in the settings interface within a given plan that you're looking at, you can just kind of click and drag the items in the drawdown order, which appear based on the kinds of stuff that you have in your plan. And you can experiment with uh, pulling from different buckets first and seeing what happens. And in the future, maybe I'll add an optimizer for that, something that like, let's say runs a bunch of combos and then gives you, hey, this is what works best for your plan. I think that might be a cool ad. But yeah, right and that now takes... there's like a default order that's sourced from the like general kind of consensus, which I've tried to establish with, with feedback from the community. And, and sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt there. What'd you, what'd you no, say? no, no worries. I was just going to clarify. I was, say, I was going to say like, and so that takes kind of taxes into account as well. Like it kind of shows you, Hey, if you start taking from this one first versus mm-hmm. this account, like this is going to be the tax implications of that. And that's why you should be grabbing from X account versus Y account first in retirement. Right. Like you can see the tax breakdown per year in the yearly summary pane and it'll show you things like early withdrawal penalties and stuff like that. I mean, if you hit any of those, you'll also get like a little bit of a warning too to try to call out like, Hey, this might not be optimal. Maybe you should look at this. (laughs) And and just to give listeners like an idea of like some of the categories, I mean, you got like your cash on hand, taxable investments, qualified HSA distributions, uh, tax deferred investments, uh, early withdrawals from from tax deferred investments, non-qualified HSA withdrawals. So like it really is broken down into, I mean, it, it's just very impressive, like the granularity of which that you could select things. It's not just, okay, I'm going to go my 401k, I'm going to go this, it, it even breaks it down into the early versus like kind of on schedule withdrawals. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Um, uh, sort of another angle on this tool that I think I meant to touch on earlier and then I forgot is that like one of the, one of the important things for me was to try to build something that respects the user and where the user isn't like secretly the product. Um, You know, there's so many services out there these days that try to like monetize people's data behind the scenes, even if they appear to be free at first, like there's, there's usually something going on there. And so I wanted to build something where people have full control over their data. So like if you open it up and you just walk through and input some stuff and um, get a sense for how the tool works, none of that stuff is sent to like a server anyway. It's all just running right in your browser. And that was kind of an interesting like part of what the, the design ethos, um, like both from from that perspective, but also from like the technical perspective of how to, how to can you really build something that's like this nuanced and that runs um, so many different simulations, especially in like the, the Monte Carlo mode that works like just in a browser and will work on a variety of different types of devices and things. 
Um, but I've had some some luck with it. It's been interesting to try to optimize some of the different subroutines and, and build something that's performant enough to actually work in that sense. But that was definitely one of the big things for me was to give people full control. And I mean, even if you upgrade to like the premium version and 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 you want like data persistence, which I should note is like not one of the features of the free version then you have an option like an array of options available for how you want your data to be saved like you can choose to sync it to the cloud you can choose to use just browser local storage or you can manage it yourself with like importing or exporting json data and so giving people choice there and autonomy and control over their data was one of my um, principles with this and i know a worry of some people with any type of financial tool is i don't want to link my accounts which is totally fine i know you, it's not like you have direct access to their mm -hmm. bank account You're using some really secure third party but i just want to clarify like there are ways for people to you know input how much their house is worth and their mortgage mm -hmm. and like all the you know all the account things that you might want you might not want to connect if you're someone who's super paranoid even though i'm sure you have like the highest encryption technology linking these bank accounts right Kyle <laughs> Yeah, I mean, currently Projection Lab doesn't involve account linking at all. Like, that's not a, <laughs> it's not a thing, and that's kind of by design. Um, it's intended for the people that, I mean, if you look at the scope of the inputs for the tool, it's really all about looking forward, trying to imagine what's going to happen throughout your life, right? And so where you are now is sort of just like, you know, that's like the current snapshot, but it's more about, what do you think is going to happen over the next like 40 or 50 years or however many? Um, if people would like to see an account linking feature, it's something that I would consider, but it wasn't part of my original design because I didn't think it was like a great fit for the kind of tool that I wanted to build. I wanted to build something that was about um, intentionality and forward thinking more than just the like, here are your current accounts and here's your current budget and stuff. And speaking of forward looking, because I think this could be a, a gotcha for some people, or maybe they just don't even understand to think about it, is when you're looking at these projections, is it taking everything and converting it into and kind of keeping it into debt, but sorry, keeping it in today's buying power? Or is it the, like the actual numbers you should expect to have at a certain age? Like, does it kind of take it and make it uh, like, you know, embed inflation into the situation so that when you're looking and thinking, okay, I spend 50,000 now. 50,000 in 2050 is also, you know, that's still going to work or do you have to do that yourself as the user? So inflation handling is one of the things that I wanted to make intuitive and give people a lot of control over because one of the early pieces of feedback that I got was that people, like some people really want to see results in today's currency. Some people really want to see results in actual currency. It doesn't seem like there's just one option that's going to work for everybody. So that's one of the things that you can control in the output and also control in the input. Like when you go in and model different kinds of expenses or how you think the value of stuff is going to change over time, you can choose whether or not you want to model those things in today's currency or actual currency. And speaking of projections on the income front, is it something where you can set like a certain percentage? Like I think my income is going to increase by 5% every year until like, I guess a, m a milestone, like retirement age, or can you mm -hmm. set like milestones? Like I'm going to start my side hustle, like in 2027 and I'm going to work on that side hustle until 2037. So my income is going to go up by like $10,000 for each of those years. Is, is that a, is that a feature that you can add or is, is that a feature that's currently included? Yeah, you can do all of that stuff for sure. And you can even get more granular with it if you want. Like, I don't know if you saw Justin, but when you're modeling the way that something changes over time, like let's say a side hustle, um, because that's one that might be like pretty variable. People might have lots of different expectations they want to experiment with. If you went in and added an income stream and said, okay, I think this thing is going to start, you know, at this particular year or this milestone or whatever, and it's going to go for this long. One of the ways that you can choose to define how that value that you expect to get from it changes over time is, you know, not only can you do the like, oh, I think it will change this much per year or this much beyond inflation per year, but you can go in and say, I want to define like a custom set of values to model out like my own sort of curve for how I expect this thing to go. And so there's like an interactive plot that you can use to just like click and drag points and build a curve for how you think that thing is going to work over time. Yeah, I'm sure there's still tons of stuff I haven't even got to, to touch on yet because I have not seen that where you get to kind of play with the own curve. I, I was also going through some of your kind of like the release notes on the, the major version mm -hmm. releases and it looks like you're pushing out releases pretty frequently, at least if 
you know, some major, some minor, but still releases pretty frequently. I see in the most recent release, you even included Roth conversion ladders. Like that's a pretty mm-hmm. cool feature that I don't think I've seen anywhere else that a lot of people in this space, especially as they go deeper down that rabbit hole, get really interested in things like a, a Roth conversion ladder. Yeah, you can model out those. I also added 529, or sorry, um, 72T distributions are substantially equal periodic payments. And um, those were both like pretty highly requested features in the roadmap for a while. Um, I think the Roth one got to just about the top of the suggested list. And so I kind of knew that I needed to address that at some point. Um, But I put it off because I knew there was some nuance to it. And I finally um, found the time to tackle it. And I hope you guys like how it turned out. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to play with it, but there's like an embedded uh, analyzer that you can use in like the form for a given account that you might choose to enable conversions on. And so it'll kind of like run a series of simulations and show you like, okay, if you used um, this schedule of Roth conversions, like here how, here's how things might turn out. And then with like the 72T one, it'll show you like, okay, using this uh, calculation method for your distribution amount, like here's how things might go and kind of show you the, uh, the spectrum of what that might look like. So if I have a, like a Roth 401k in there as an account, I could go into some settings and make it do the projections based on the idea that I'm going to take that, move it into a Roth IRA and then, and then conversion la- or sorry, I, if I have a traditional, let me start that over. <laughs> so let's say I have a traditional 401k and I can go in the model and, you know, play with the settings to make it understand that I plan on taking that to a mm-hmm. traditional IRA and then eventually doing a conversion ladder so that I could touch that money before I'm 59 and a half. Right. And so you can look at the implications of that. Like, what does that do to the l- amount of tax that you pay throughout your lifetime? What does that do to like the early withdrawal penalties that you might incur throughout your lifetime and some of those other metrics. And you can see that right in the form when you're kind of playing around with the inputs. And then of course, in the actual like plan UI, you can see the, the full blown effects and go into any given year and kind of examine like, okay, here's what the cash flow looks like. There's a little sand key visualization for that and, as well as the yearly summary pane with the expansion panel. So you can see all the individual line items. Awesome. Yeah, no, this thing is like crazy robust. I know before you mentioned you're not a sales and marketing guy, but the reason we're talking to you today is because Mr. Money Mustache, one of the most prominent figures in this space, shouted you out on Twitter. Was that just like happenstance or did you connect with them somehow or like how did that come to be? Yeah, so I think this kind of connects to like maybe a piece of advice that I would have for folks that are interested in like building their own thing and trying to launch it and see if they can grow it a little bit, which is to treat your first hundred users like really well, like really try to connect with those folks and understand what it is that they like about the tool and where they would like to see you take it. Because it was one of those people that had a friend who knew Pete, uh, the Mr. Money Mustache dude. And um, so he kind of like connected me a little bit and I sent an email to him like a year ago, just kind of saying like, Hey, I made this thing. Maybe you'd like to check it out. And I think at the time he was like, oh, this looks cool, but I didn't really hear much back. And so I circled back like, I guess a few weeks ago now, just to say like, hey, I ended up working on this for another year and here's all the stuff that changed. And then all of a sudden I had like 400 people on the site at once. And I was like, oh, something must have happened. So I wasn't expecting <laughs> him to, to tweet about it, but um, it, was, it was really cool to get that kind of feedback from one of the people that was like one of the original inspirations for for me i guess and when i think about a tool like this uh, you know i know we've said it a bunch of times about like the robustness the granularity but especially because you know folks in our situations are not in typical situations we're not just in the we're working till we're 60 we've had the one source of income like everything's pretty simple and so i can imagine like for people who are in the profession of doing financial planning could really use a tool like this to especially if they're targeting an audience more like ours, where it's going to have these very nuanced circumstances. Is that something you see where there's actually professionals who are sitting there and using this tool to work with their clients? Yeah, I have a small handful of advisors who use the tool and I put together a pro version to help support that community. So it's kind of like a wrapper around the standard projection lab interface that gives you an extra dashboard so you can create and manage client profiles and invite people to like link their accounts so they can have access and you can control as an advisor whether or not you want your clients to have permission to make permanent changes or like just experimental changes. Awesome. So that was definitely a use case that I had in mind and it's seeing a little bit of traction. I'm sure it would see more if I did like literally any marketing or outreach. <laughs> I think my 
my typical pattern is that I spend like 99% of my time with my head in the sand, just trying to make the product cool and add the kinds of features that people want to see, because I guess that's where my passion is with it. Um, well, when the product is cool, it just markets itself. I mean, <laughs> to, to, to testament, you know, Pete shouted you out and you didn't even know he was going to, you didn't ask him for a shout out. You know, you weren't like paying for a shout out. He just thought the tool was awesome. Cause you've been, like you said, working on it for the past year with your head in the sand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Cody. I definitely had to do a double take when I glanced over and saw the analytics numbers. I usually keep a, a window open just so I can kind of see like the, the real time traffic. And, um, that was, that was a little nuts. The dude definitely has some followers. <laughs> and one of the last things I was curious about, because like you mentioned, you're kind of a one person team. Um, this is a very robust application with a lot of, you know, uh, you try to walk people through it, but there is a lot of learning and I can imagine people hit things and whether it's a real bug or just, they think there's something wrong. They're probably trying to reach out to someone and get help. Are you handling all that yourself too? Or I know you mentioned a discord server. Is that a way where people mm -hmm. could go there? And that way the feedback is kind of crowdsourced where people other than yourself can help, you know, st users are just getting started. Yeah. Discord is perfect for that. Um, I monitor it pretty closely and try to be really responsive, but there are also some really helpful people from the projection lab community that can clarify some things. And you know, I think I saw you ask a question on there, Justin, and somebody might've chimed in. So. Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's why I was like trying to throw it out there. <laughs> yeah. It's great that some of those early adopters are passionate enough about the tool and want to see it keep growing and they want yeah, to help out some other folks who have questions too. Awesome. Well, uh, for our listeners who want to, you know, tr who want to try out Projection Lab, who want to connect with you and just follow along with all the new feature updates and what you have going on, where is the best place or places for them to do that? Well, you can go to projectionlab.com. That's the tool. Um, if you want, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, K Nolan with an underscore in front. Um, I probably need to use that platform more. I've been neglecting it for a while. But, uh, oh, and then I also, if, uh, if anybody wants to kick the tires on the premium features, um, I made a coupon code that your listeners can use. It's just uh, FISHO, F-I-S-H-O-W, for 20% off. Awesome. Thanks, man. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kyle, for, um, we're honored for you to be, sorry, <laughs> we're honored that you chose us to be your first kind of podcast to jump on. And uh, this product is Super cool. And I know you probably don't think of it as like a product. You think about it as like this, like, a, you know, this project that you've built that is very close and dear to you and not just something you're trying to do to make money, which comes through, obviously. And I think it's made it into the really awesome product that it is today. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I'm, I'm passionate to keep working on it. And there's no shortage of ideas for how to keep making it better.